today I want to finish up our discussion of Plato. I'm going to do it in a way that's pretty common in philosophical discussion by talking about the three axes upon which Plato's dualism turns. He is regarded historically as a dualist. His philosophy has an inherent dualism. Spencer, the word dualism means what is immediately provoked in your mind with that word? Something about conflict. Conflict is correct. So you just should distinguish the English words duality or dual, which simply means two, a two-ness, from dualism, which always implies conflict. You want your marriage to be a duality. You hope it isn't a dualism. Well, in Plato's philosophy, we have several different points at which it seems to be a dualism. And these are words familiar to you now. There's a metaphysical dualism. There's an epistemological dualism. There's an anthropological dualism. Now, the word metaphysical, I haven't talked about a lot, so I just want to get it in front of you now. But usually when you're thinking of metaphysics, where that term comes from is from Aristotle. Aristotle distinguished two classes of discussion, that which is physical. And then for lack of a better term, he talked about that which is beyond or above or after physics. Meta means after in Greek. And so he just, as a matter of convenience, called it metaphysis, metaphysics. That is that which is studied after physics. So physics has to do with physical forces. I throw a marker at Josiah. It strikes him in the head and knocks him out. That would be physics. The reason why I throw the marker, that Josiah is sitting over there acting up with a bad attitude, that kind of thing, that would be metaphysics. That gets into the whys of life. So in a sense, the physical is a description of the what. The metaphysical is a description of the why in very broad terms. Metaphysics has to do with ultimate answers to ultimate questions. For Plato, of course, the metaphysical level is the ideal level, the level of ideals. Ideal circles, ideal virtue, ideal values. All right, so in Plato, you've got a metaphysical dualism. Why? OK, Jake, I'm giving you time to think about it. Why? <laughs> Wherein is the dualism in Plato's metaphysics? Well, good start. That's great. There it seems like there's humans exist in this world that is only we only see shadows of reality. Right. So although that's only all that we can really see as people, there's constantly a moral goal of trying to see the form of what is real. That's pretty good. That's a pretty good answer. Yeah. Good. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll only supplement uh, Jacob's response there by saying this, that for Plato there is a tension between the perfect and the imperfect. You go back to the parable of the caves. Many people are perfectly content to live in the cave. They see the shadows, they think, whoa, look at that cool shadow. They don't know it's a shadow. They think it's reality. And when you try to try to persuade them, as Jacob said, that there's something higher. There's a more important level of truth. They're bored. It's going to conflict with their, you know, the game they plan to watch this Saturday. It's going to conflict with more mundane stuff that occupies their lives. And so there's this inherent tension between this receptacle world where we're all comfortable 
and this higher level where the true values reside, you see. And that goes all through his philosophy. We're constantly in this struggle. And he's, he's always in an argument with us. He's always wanting us to let go of this world. This world is of incidental importance. The higher world is discovered through the inward quest. That is inward in the sense of using your mind to think of higher things rather than simply relying on your senses, which only teach you of these material things that don't matter that much. Please understand the sentence I just gave you. Because that's the heart of his metaphysical dualism. I see glaze on your eyeballs. <laughs> I don't know if I can. It was such a great sentence, you know. They only come once in a lifetime, so. <laughs> Plato is constantly in a contest with us. You see, he's a preacher. He's not just giving us platitudes. By the way, the word platitude comes from Plato, but oddly, he's not giving us just platitudes, platitudes. He's in a contest. He wants to cause us to let go of the stuff that we tend to value most. You know, the cool stuff that you can buy at Walmart. And he says, wait a minute. Don't you realize that when you surround yourself with all that stuff, you're still empty because outside the cave is reality. Let me help you get there. And most of us say, no, 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 I'd rather just have this neat new widget that I bought at Walmart. I'm going to be happy with that for a while. And we go from one widget to the next, one shadow to the next, never letting go. You know, getting outside the cave. That's just metaphysical dualism. So far, so good? That kind of makes sense? It's the idea? <coughs> Krista. Um, a couple of days ago, you were talking about how Plato said that the philosophers were the only ones that could get into this, or yes. they could see this in yes. the real world. Right. Did you think he was, he was the only one who had experienced that, or were there other? No, he, uh, he believed that he was a great pioneer. Plato believed that, well, he believed that, you know, he got his inspiration from Socrates. Socrates just sort of opened the door. But Plato really did think, he thought that he was, I mean, all modesty aside, the greatest thing that had happened in the history of man. You know, I mean, let's not, let's not, you know, let's not underestimate his own estimation of himself. He was, uh, he was pretty uh, persuaded that he really had gotten it. But it's sort of like Einstein. Einstein was able to see in a flash of genius a way of thinking about the universe that most of us ordinary mortals would never figure out. We'd never get. I mean, how many of us would just sit around and think, you know, I bet the faster you go, the slower time goes. Well, that's pretty obvious, isn't it? I thought time always went the same speed. What are you talking about? But, you know, it's been proven. Einstein was right. The, the higher your speed, the slower the clock ticks, as a matter of fact. Well, now, a lot of people understand that. It took a genius like Einstein to see it first, but now others can follow on the path, and they see how it, how it is. It's still hard to conceive of, but it's been demonstrated, right? Plato kind of sees himself as an Einstein. He saw in a flash of genius this reality of an ideal world and the world of the receptacle and so on, and now he feels he can lead others to see it too. But Krista, it's only a tiny minority. It's not most of us. It's just a few. But he wants to make the appeal to everybody. You know. What was the, what was the uh, inscription over the door of Plato's Academy? You learned it in Bible context. And it was, Megan? Yeah, the Academy. Well, yeah, but there was a little inscription there. Remember this? I tested you on it, Sydney. It was? It was, let none but geometers enter here. Exactly. Remember that? Let none but geometers enter here. 
Well, for Plato, a geometer was somebody who could think about the fact that there's got to be a perfect circle, a perfect triangle. Geometry was the doorway to his ideal world. Can you see that? Not everybody gets that. Somebody would, some people would just like to get a new iPod. They don't care about perfect circles. That's the, that's the most, most people are there. But every so often you get somebody who can rise above Go outside the cave, see the sunlight, see reality. Maybe you're one of them, but probably not. His epistemological dualism is related. It basically um, goes something like this. If you, his meta, you have to start with his metaphysics and then his epistemology. Epistemology makes more sense. So in his metaphysics, you'd say there is being, there is becoming, and there is nothingness. So a three-storied house in his, in his metaphysics. I'm still on metaphysics here for a minute. Being is the level of the ideal. What pre-Socratic philosopher was the champion of being? His answer is, Sarah, great pre-Socratic is the champion of being, is named. I know this, but I don't, Thales is not it. Thales is not it, but you're in the right ballpark. Joe, do you remember? Um, uh, Kayla, it is? Parmenides. Parmenides. So Parmenides got the right answer at the point of celebrating being. The great champion of becoming among the pre-Socratics was, this guy's name is, Megan? Uh, Heraclitus. Heraclitus. Please just get this in your DNA. Parmenides, being, Heraclitus, becoming. Let's see. And then down here at the bottom is what I should actually call non-being. But I'm calling it nothingness. But either one is fine. But do you see, being and non-being are opposites. Being and nothingness are opposites. And hanging in the middle in a kind of twilight zone metaphysically is becoming. It can't quite be real because it keeps changing. But it can't be quite not real because we keep experiencing it. This transient, changing, fluctuating, middle ground that we call existence. Standing out of being, standing out of nothingness, out there in the kind of shifting sands of our human existence. Well, that was the world Heraclitus gave us. No philosopher has given us this exactly. Some, philosoph some philosophers are called nihilists or nihilists, champions of the nothing, like Nietzsche. But we haven't really found anyone like that yet. All right, so that's his metaphysics. His epistemology corresponds to it. So for Plato, the highest level of, of understanding what he calls knowledge corresponds to being. I'll put it this way, the highest level of truth or the highest level of reality corresponds to knowledge of being. So if you want to know the most important stuff, right? If you want to know what's most important, then what, you, what should you spend your time contemplating? What should you be thinking about in Plato's school? Then you think about the perfect world. That's right. You think about the ideal world. That's why let none but geometers enter here. Because it's only geometers who are thinking about that ideal. There's more to it, but not less than geometry, you know, in his view. You want to know what's really important? You quit looking at nature like Mr. Dykstra wants to show you, looking at 
grasshopper. Who cares about grasshoppers? Who cares about pine needles, for Pete's sake? Even who cares about Mount St. Helens? This is Plato speaking. You understand? <laughs> yeah, Gore is just the messenger. He is not voicing any personal opinions on any of this. But Plato would say, who cares about any of that? When you could close your eyes and reason into this higher level of truth that really matters. Why look at Mount St. Helens when you could think about an Isosocles triangle? Let's face it. Am I winning you? Am I getting you? Probably not. All right. That's where Plato wants to take you, though. He wants to take you to that place of ideals. Then he says, the next level down, the truth that you get from examining what your senses report is what he calls opinion. I look out the window and I see a pine tree, and I say, oh, oh look at that. There's a pine tree. At best, what I've given you at that point is opinion. Because really, what have I told you? I've only told you about a shadow, right? You follow that? And I mean, at best, it only has relative significance or importance. And then, for Plato, the level of truth that corresponds to non-being or nothingness is the term, this comes from a Greek word, the word ignorance. Now Matthew asked a few days ago a very astute question, but he raised it a little bit ahead of what I wanted to talk about it, but I did give a short answer to it. Matthew, do you remember your question and my short answer to your brilliant question? It was the first day we talked about Plato, and you stood up and stoutly asked the question, what? <laughs> See, I had registered with me. I thought, hey, it's not a bad question. <laughs> so uh, now he's forgotten it by now. Does anybody remember the question that Matthew asked? I was when we were talking about knowledge of the ideal world, and the question was? Um, well, I think he asked this question. I don't know if it's the same one that you're looking for. Can you ask, what's the standard? I don't know. Uh, not quite. Matthew? Uh, <laughs> Sarah? Did he ask where the ideal world came from? Okay, not exactly, but where our knowledge of it came from. That was your question. Remember that? It was an epistemological question, you know. Matthew heard me talking, and, uh, you know, on behalf of Plato, about the fact that we know that that ideal is there. We know that it's there. We know not just a chair, but chairness. We know not something is beautiful, but we know beauty. Have you ever thought about the difference between that? It's one thing to know something is beautiful. It's another thing to know beauty. And yet, do you realize you can never call anything beautiful but for the idea of beauty? How do you make that judgment? How do you distinguish Mona Lisa from Betty Sue? There's a standard. It's not the perfect Mona Lisa. It's the perfect notion of beauty itself. What is that? And yet we go through life constantly using it, don't we? I mean, all the time we use it. It's just there. Do you think dogs make those distinctions? Do orangutan? I don't know. I've never been an orangutan, so I can't say for sure. But the impression we have is that a dog could look at the Mona Lisa, and a dog could look at the Betty Sue, and to the dog, it wouldn't be any, there'd be no difference. You know, it's just two pieces of paper. But somehow we see something in it. You know what I'm saying? What is that? Well, it's one of two things. It's either nothing but a Fig Newton in your mind, just an accident that you call one thing beauty and another thing not, nothing ugly, or there is actually beauty somewhere. Y'all follow that? Do you, do you see how significant that is? 
if there is not beauty somewhere, then whenever you call something beautiful, it's just an accident of your opinion. It's no more significant than saying, I like Butterfingers more than I like Reese's candy bars. You know, it really is nothing more than that, unless there is beauty somewhere. And Plato says there must be. Otherwise, this world and all the things in it that we call significant collapses into nonsense. And so he wants to make us students of true beauty. He wants us to not focus on beautiful things, but beauty in and of itself. And he's trying to lead us into that path, then, uh, epistemologically. Well, how do we know it's there? We have an idea that it's there, but Matthew's question was, how did that, where did that idea come from? How do we know it? And his answer is, of course, Matthew, do you, know the, you remember the answer I gave you? I said, here's the short answer. Uh, we may come back to it later. Well, now it's later, and we're coming back to it. Uh, he said it just is or something like that. Like, not quite. You're, like, you're you right. Have it there. Yeah, but why do we have it there? Uh, we came from another place, and we remember. We remember it. What it was yeah. like. Okay. So here's you know. Here's what you need to know. I know sometimes students live at that level. I can't help it. <laughs> I want you to fly with me in the clouds of the greatness of these thoughts, but some of you are just thinking, yeah, but what do we need to know? Okay, here's what you need to know. Plato's, theory, Plato's epistemology involves what he calls the theory of recollection. The theory of recollection. How do I know perfect circles, perfect triangles, all of this stuff? How do I know beauty? How do I know truth? How do I know the good? How do I even have an idea that there is this cave and that we can be inside it or outside it? How do I know any of this? Because I remember it because I was once there. So he believes in the pre-existence of the human soul. He believes you existed before you were a human being here. Now, he actually talks about reincarnation, and he gets into that whole deal. But for now, just don't worry about that. He believes that your soul comes from and returns to the ideal world. And so your ideas, Sidney, of a perfect circle are, is something you remember and something you will again experience if you're a good girl, okay. which in Sydney's case is, you know, not too tough. Okay. Some of you guys, I'm not so sure. Yes, Josiah. Why did it take so many thousands of years for people to remember the ideal world? It took a genius like Plato okay. to help us. Plato's, a, Plato's very, uh, you know, he sees himself as a, as a savior in some ways, a philosophical savior. I just want you to uh, keep in mind as we're kind of rolling through Plato here, notice how, while it's not Christian exactly, it is compatible with a lot of things Christians say. Don't we sometimes talk about how, you know, this world is not that important, we shouldn't be just constantly attached to the stuff of this world. There's more important things to be thinking about, and so on. I mean, don't we talk that way? And in some ways, we sound a lot like Plato, and early Christians found a huge common ground with Plato, and the whole phenomenon in history we call Gnosticism is really a hybrid of Christian thought on the one hand and Platonism on the other. I hope you caught Mr. Dr. Wang yesterday, made that passing comment about that. And he really did a very nice job, just in about 30 seconds, of recapitulating that point. But, um, uh, all right, the third uh, uh, point is anthropological dualism. This may be the most important in terms of its practical consequences in the history of Christianity. Anthropological dualism. 
Ms. Spaghettis? <laughs> I just love the facial expressions sometimes happen in here. It just warms my heart to see a look of absolute panic, distress, heart-wrenching, silent screams. <laughs> you can actually figure this one out, though. What do you suppose? We've talked about the meaning of dualism, and you know the meaning of anthropology or anthropological, so if I simply throw that phrase at you, anthropological dualism, then you would immediately assume it has reference to what? Very close. Conflict not between men, but conflict, can you change your preposition? Conflict where? Not between men, but within men, yeah, and women. It's the civil war inside you. Sometimes we have conflicts outside of us. I get in a conflict with somebody over something. We settle it in the proper way. We go out in the alley and punch each other to death. You know, isn't that the way it happens? That's how we settle conflicts among us. But Plato would say the only reason we have conflicts among us is because we have a conflict within us. There's a war going on inside you. That is the reason that there's these wars going on outside of us. Does that sound like anything in the Bible? You ever heard anybody in the Bible say something like that? Who? Can you have anything? Who says that? Something like that in the, almost those very words, actually. Kristen? Paul does. Paul does. I actually have somebody else in mind, but you're awfully, he, he says things that certainly point in that direction. Who says this in the New Testament? Where do the wars and conflicts among you arise? Do they not arise from your own lusts and passions within? Who says that? Josiah? That is James chapter 4. Did you get that, Kayla? No, Avery did. No, oh, Avery did. Okay. <laughs> he was. Well, I saw you high fiving, and I thought, well, you know, I didn't know. I, good job. Good job. Congratulations. I didn't know. All right. So, uh, Plato says the same thing. He says that this. Twofold metaphysic of his, the ideal and the receptacle, translates in your world into the conflict between what he calls your soul and your body. Your soul comes from the perfect world of ideals. Your body comes from the receptacle, material world. Your soul is immortal. He has arguments for the immortality of the soul the fundamental indestructibility of the soul. Your body is transient. It comes from the earth. It returns to the earth. It's earth. What does it mean? Transient means what? Spencer, what does it mean for something to be transient? What, what is a transient? It's what you don't want to grow up to be. What is a transient? Okay, the, that, that would be, that could be true. The old, uh, you probably haven't heard this term. It's a term that, you know, used to be used a lot. A transient was what you somebody, what you'd call a homeless person, somebody who kind of lives on the streets. They're just a transient. They're just moving. They're, they're, they're never settled down. They never have a distinct address, you know, that kind of thing. That's, I don't think you hear that term so much anymore, but it used to be used a lot for that. All right, so your body is transient. Your body is changing. Your body is temporary. It derives from the earth and it returns to the earth. It's dirt. Your soul, however, is immaterial. And it comes from this other place. And you are in a conflict thus in yourself between your higher and your lower forces. Part of you is inclined toward goofing off in class, giggling, not paying attention, being distracted. That's your body. 
part of you somewhere inside is actually interested in these lofty thoughts, that's your soul. But for most of us, the body overwhelms the soul. The body takes over, and we are dominated by its base instincts that cause us to just not really catch what's going on. But for some rare, very rare and unusual students, they are actually dominated by the soul which is interested in those higher things. All right. And Plato, of course, wants to appeal especially to those people, those people who will overrule the instincts of the body and give greater attention by far to the instincts of, the learning of, the knowledge of, the importance of the soul. Hence my illustration here, you see, two guys goofing off. On the other hand, Kayla paying perfect attention. You see how that works? You kind of see. Yeah. <laughs> All right, you see that? Does that correspond to anything you've ever heard of in the Christian faith? Is there anything you've ever been exposed to in your Christian teaching that sounds a little bit like the platonic conflict between body and soul? Julie? Our, our war between the flesh and the The flesh and the spirit. I hope some of you actually had thought of that before I asked it. All right, Paul talks about the flesh wars against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh, right? And we're paralyzed. We cannot do what we want. I don't have time to defend this. I'm just simply going to say it to you right now, kind of like educational fiat. It is not the same thing. Plato does, or I, Paul does not mean by the spirit and the flesh the same thing Plato meant by the soul and the body. It looks similar, but it is not the same. Paul is not a Platonist, although many people accuse him of it for that reason. We will certainly return to that theme at a later time. Arrivederci.